Welcome, my awesome friends. It's day 35, and I have with me my friends from the PMP Exam Immersion Daily Scrum. You want to say hi to everyone? Hello. Let's hear your voices. Come on now, those in the background trying to be all cute. Come on. Hi. Hi. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. So those of you who have never met us before, we are getting ready for the PMP exam. And we've been going through the journey using the PMP exam immersion. And I saw Miguel for a quick second. We've got our friends, Cynthia and Trace, and a whole lot of other folks who are also on this call that you cannot see. But it's a pleasure to be with you here on day 35. Day 35 is when we wrap up the entire 35 tasks. Wow. How did it feel going through 35 tasks? Anyone? Any comments? Was it easy? <laughs> Trey says no. Cynthia says it wasn't. So my recommendation for everyone is you got seven days in a week. Even if you were studying just one every day, you would be done in 35 days. You'd be done in a month and five days. So welcome to day 35. Let's jump straight in and see what this day has for us. So on the final day, day 35, you know, I always open up with a discussion. So what is organizational culture? Because PMI talks about it a lot. It's here in the immersion book. Give some examples of organizational changes. How could organizational change affect the project? How could a project impact an organization? How should the project manager support organizational change? And then I say read up about the change models covered in the video on Prazion's YouTube channel. I have the methods, models, and artifacts in the seventh edition talked about at length. All right. So these questions, you could find answers to them, but let's go into task 35. Now, day 35 is simply titled Support Organizational Change. So let's jump into the enablers. Now, have you ever been in a firm that was shifting from one way of working to another way of working? I have. And to be quite honest, it wasn't really embraced because the people doing the work hadn't been brought on board to say, this is what we're going to be doing and this is why. They were just told, a command is coming from on high, thou shalt do this. And of course, people fought against it. So have you ever been involved in a change in an organization that went well? Anyone that actually was well implemented that everyone said, yeah, we welcome this. Have you? Not really, right? Because <laughs> a lot of times people don't do what PMI advocates in the uh, practice guide for change management in organizations. They've got an entire different guide for managing change in organizations. And one of the things they talk about is formulating the change and really crafting it and planning and understanding and having sense-making sessions. So you've got to assess your organization's culture and know where your organization's at, those who are resistant to certain things. You know, I remember a firm that they invited us to a while back, Roy and I, and we were given the warning up front, hey, engineers don't like this topic. So when you're training them, you better watch it. You better be careful because our culture is a little bit different. So Roy being the expert he was, he went in there, did his magic, and everyone was lapping up agile within a few days. But it's important to assess your organization's culture. All right, number two, evaluate the impact of organizational change to your project. Is your organization going through some turmoil, some turbulence? That could affect your project. You've got to know about it. If there's some unrest, if there's a change in power, you know, change of the guard, you've got to be aware of that. CEO is leaving, new CEO is coming in, or there's been some sort of takeover. You've got to be, be aware of all that stuff. I see you, Mark. I see you. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> So you got to be aware of all those things. And number three, evaluate the impact of the project this time to the organization. So it goes both ways. The firm's change and turmoil could affect the project. Or maybe it's good times. Maybe people have just received a big old bonus. Everyone's in good spirits. Or maybe it's the reverse. And then on the flip side, if your project is implementing some monumental change to the firm, you're not going to be the most popular person. So this is just helping you to see the landscape of business on the PMP exam. And you know what? For this area, not only do you need business acumen, you also need tact to be able to solve problems, to build alliances and things like that. All right. So that's it. Let's move on to talk about organizational change 
management essentials. So when we talk about organizational change, like I said, I would like for you folks to take a look at PMI's uh, managing change in organizations. If you are a member of the PMI, I want you to just browse it really quick. It's actually talked about in this book. I mean, sooner or later, this book is going to be talked about more because the sixth edition is going out of print. And I'm not saying go buy it. I'm just showing you where some of this stuff is when it comes to managing organizational change. It's talked about on page 160. I'm, I'm just going to read a few for you. So we have PMI's managing change in organizations. Step one, formulate the change. This element focuses on building the rationale. You see, that's what's missing in a lot of firms. You see, they don't build the rationale. People don't know why they're changing. And then we have plan change. It says, this helps prepare people for the transition. Number three, implement the change. Number four, manage the transition. This element considers how to address needs related to the change that may surface. And then sustain the change. So if there's a few pages that will help you for business in this, it's going to be page one, 160, 161, 162, uh, 163. And believe it or not, I've talked about all of these on YouTube. So um, I'll endeavor to put some links to the video, this video, when it posts. We have the John Carter's model, which is on page 162. We have the Virginia Serta model on page 163. I talk about this a lot on that video. And then page 164, William Bridges transition model. It's not as though PMI is going to ask you questions that map directly back to any of these names or terminology, but just understanding the concepts uh, behind change management can really help you to grasp this area. You do know that this new exam does not have a fixed chapter in the PMBOK guide for change management in organizations, which is why I'm recommending reading it here. Check out a few easy, easy, easy questions. These are not difficult, I promise. Here we go. And uh, these were written by one of my question writers who is excited about the seventh edition. So let's see what he put together. You become aware that the FAA is planning to change the flight path for a major airport located just two miles from your nuclear plant. The new flight path would reduce airline noise for residents, but would require more than 50% of the air traffic to fly directly over the cooling towers. What should you do? Let's go ahead and launch a poll and spend about a minute Let me know what you would do. All right. Thank you for your participation. Let's go ahead and end it. Uh, three, two, and one. Let's end the poll. And let's share the results. It's rather polarized. So this question writer in his rationale <clears throat> believes that you should uphold PMI's principle of stewardship. Now, I'm going to read this for you. This is on page 27. And it reads, under compliance, stewards comply with laws, rules, regulations, and requirements that are properly authorized within or outside of the organization. However, high-performing projects seek ways to integrate compliance more fully into project culture, creating more alignment with diverse and potentially conflicting guidelines. Stewards strive for compliance with guidelines intended to protect them 
their organization, their stakeholders, and the public at large. In instances where stewards face conflicting guidelines or questions regarding whether or not actions align with established guidelines, stewards seek appropriate counsel and direction. So you can probably guess where this is going. This project manager who wrote these questions believes that doing nothing will be docile. So don't do nothing, okay? Support the FAA plans for change, but it's just two miles, see? So you need to get proper insights as to whether what the FAA is planning to do could affect you, remember? It's a nuclear plant, and there could be some adverse uh, variables that could impact your business. It would be best, instead of doing nothing, instead of just fully supporting without doing research, and instead of saying the change should not occur because that's presumptuous, you should seek appropriate counsel and guidance and go from there. So doing nothing, not good. Supporting without understanding is not good. And telling them not to do it is not good either. You, you got to have a better understanding of what is at play. So that was the answer given. A little bit different from questions you're used to, huh? Okay, let's go to our next question. You're managing a construction project. One of your stakeholders has suggested a change in requirement. The change seems pretty minor, but because you apply systems thinking, what should you do? Again, this is one of PMI's principles. We're looking at a higher level view of the world. I'll give you a minute. All right, we're just about a minute. Let's go ahead and the poll. Everyone nailed this one. <laughs> well done. Yeah. So it's a minor change, but saying nothing needs to be done is presumptuous and uh, bad practice, like malpractice, if you ask me. Ignoring the change and rejecting are both negative. So the correct answer is D. Awesome. Very good. For those of my friends who have had a rodeo with the exam on occasions past, just chat in to me if you think that the length of these questions is on par or are they longer? Just chat in to me in the chat box. I know what you think. All right, let's move on. Okay. You are leading a project involving highly competent and engaged staff. Things have been progressing rather smoothly on the project, but senior management just approved a change for the project that includes new scope to be delivered within the next two weeks. What leadership style would work best with this latest change? Let's go ahead and relaunch.
All right, my friends. Let us go ahead and begin to round up. There's a page in the seventh, and I want to point out to you just for context purposes. Okay. Let's go ahead and end the poll. And let's share the results. Okay. So think about it. You're leading a project involving highly competent and engaged staff. Yeah, they're competent, they're engaged. Things have been progressing smoothly, but there's a change, as it says, for the project that includes new scope on top of what they're already doing. So there's a disruption here of sorts, okay? When there's a disruption, it would be presumptuous to say, the team's gonna be good. Let's just move on because this is a major difference from what has been happening. You're asking for new scope to be delivered, probably changing the configuration of things. So no change in style is required. That's highly debatable. Let's take a look at page 156. Can Blanchard's situational leadership two model, it measures project team member development using competence and commitment as two main variables. Competence is a combination of ability, knowledge, and skills. Commitment speaks to the confidence and motivation an individual has. As an individual's competence and commitment evolve, leadership styles evolve from directing to coaching to supporting to delegating in order to meet the individual's needs. So the PM who wrote this question does not think you should not change your style when there's a major change on the project. This individual believes that as a result of a change in direction, your leadership needs to be situational and change in accordance. So the stakes are higher. Stuff needs to be done. You're going to go from more delegating or lazy fare to be more directing. You wouldn't be totalitarian. Thank goodness no one chose that. That is totally negative. Empower delegation. Again, because the stakes are high, it's not the best one to use in this case. Not changing your style will be presumptuous. So do you remember how the situational leadership model looks? Looks something like this. You got the y-axis, which is support, and the x-axis, which is more of the direction. And this is in the immersion book. So if you take a look at this, you got four quadrants. And the first quadrant is where you're more directing. This is where you're more coaching. This is where you're more supporting in terms of leadership style. And this is more delegating. So the argument is if you're here or somewhere else and the stakes change and things need to be done in a time crunch, it is likely that your approach is going to be more directive. That is not to say micromanaging. There's a difference. You're just going to be more directive in what needs to be done. Okay. So that's the answer to that one. All right, let's take a look. And I'm glad that you're taking more questions from a number of question writers. You do know that our mock exam was written by eight question writers. So it's not just me writing the questions. So it's good to take things in perspective. For those people who are not on hpmexam.com, if you haven't been for one of our uh, immersion programs, then you don't have access to uh, mock exam. So what we're going to do now, we're going to make an offer to those people who have not come on the program to take one of our mock exams. It's a limited offer. You can take it. You can find it for purchase at mock.hpmexam.com. So 180 questions is brutal. It's a very brutal exam. If you're able to sail through this, then you're probably good. Okay. And all our friends on the call, they've got access to that mock. So it's nothing that you haven't seen before. All right, let's move to our next question. Your project was running late, so the subject matter experts recommended that user acceptance tests on a project should be omitted since the technology is operational at other factories. The project plan was adjusted with this modification. However, 
after implementation, the technology is not working as expected. What should the project manager do? Let's go ahead and launch the poll. There you go. All right, five seconds. <laughs> well done. Let's end the poll and share the results. Everyone got this one right. I'm really excited you got it right. There's one that used to trip people up, but I genetically modified it. This question is a PMI back in the day question. So option B did not have in the daily scrum. I added that to have mercy on everyone because if I take this out, then it becomes so plausible an option. And I had a lot of people getting this one wrong. But just be aware, the real exam could be that brutal. It could just take this out. But you, you need to know that reviewing a defect report with a team really does nothing. You need to understand the root cause, right? And because it says... Um, the uh, tests on a project were omitted and we're talking about technology and so on, there's no guarantee that there are even any uh, defect reports because defects are usually for a product. In this case, it sounds more like an implementation. So the chance of having a defect report are a lot less in a situation like this. All right, you would have defective machinery, but not necessarily a, a report. But even then the best thing to do, because this is reactive, it's like saying, all right, review the report, but the, the action is not conclusive. This says review the report, conduct a root cause analysis and identify corrective action. This is a lot more robust. So the one that tells you to do something that results in moving the situation forward is, is always a better option. All right, here we go. Here's another one. You're in the final stages of building a software product for your organization that an existing customer has agreed to purchase once it is complete. You have been approached by another potential customer who states they too would be willing to buy the product if it had one additional feature that is not currently in scope. What is the first thing you should do? So do you get the scenario here? Read it again. I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll. Let's launch. Give you a minute. All right, time just hit one minute. Let's go ahead and round it up. Three, two, and one. All right, so a little bit polarized. So let's go through the logic. We're making this tool and it's for client A. And then another client B off the street says, hey, you know, if you get that thing with this additional feature, we would buy it too. That's an opportunity. It's a positive risk. It's not absolutely guaranteed, but it is a positive risk. So what should you do first? You should log the positive risk. You should assess if it's something that is going to be done, count the cost, and if it is something that makes sense, just the same way you do negative risks with positive risks, if it makes sense, then you have a risk response. It might require a change request. But at this point, the first thing you should do is not to submit a change request. The first thing is to log it as a positive risk. And then you want to begin counting, okay, well, will this cost? And then it goes to CCB and all that stuff. Okay. So that one is like the chicken and the egg. What should come first is this. 
because he didn't really allude to that happening, just said, you've been approached by another potential customer who states they too would be willing to buy the product if it had one additional feature. It's not currently in scope, so you can't do it. That's true, but you got to log it as an opportunity. It's not a negative risk. It's an opportunity. Very trickily well, worded. Question. Uh -huh. Good question. Why can't we do both in tangent, both A and B? You and have then, to do um, you have to do of... one. You have to do one first. You have to follow the protocol. It's like a process map. Loop. Yeah, you always have to log first. That's right. Yeah, yeah, you log first. Great, great question. Uh, if it was a thanks. negative risk, you know, no problem. If it was a negative risk and it said the customer is upset and wants an additional feature, customer A, not B. Let's say there's no customer B on the scene, just a customer A. And customer A says they want this. Well, it's not a risk. It's actually something that needs to be logged as a change request. But in this case, it's not a legitimate change request because it's, hey, I would do this if something, something, and they're not even part of the project. Does that make sense? Why it's an opportunity? Not a yes, change? It does. Yeah, because it's not legitimate. You. You're welcome. All right. Shout out to my buddy who wrote these uh, funny questions. All right, let's go to our next one. In backlog refinement meetings, we discuss requirements coming up in the next increment to gain valuable feedback from the customer. Is that true or false? Let's go ahead and have a very quick launch here with a true or false poll. What do you think? True or false? Thank you. A few more seconds. True or false is don't really appear on, on the exam, but they're very notorious in the, uh, for those of you who have taken the PSM, I have a friend on the call that took PSM. Did you get, you got true or false is, didn't you? She knows who she is. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You gotta love the true or false is from Ken's company. Yeah, very tricky. Yeah, and they're, tricky they're like tricky. yeah, they're quite tricky. They're not, they're not user user friendly at all. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for pitching in. All right, so let's go ahead and end the poll and share the results. A little bit polarized. So let's read what exactly is here in PMI's Agile Practice Guide under demos or reviews. Right? Oh, not demos or reviews. I beg your pardon. Backlog refinement. This is on page 52. All right, so let's read. In iteration-based agile, the product owner often works with the team to prepare some stories for the upcoming iteration during one or more sessions in the middle of the iteration. The purpose of these meetings is to refine enough stories so the team understands what the stories are and how large the stories are in relation to each other. And then it goes into, you could do this using just in time. You could time box it to a one hour discussion midway. Um, and then it says multiple refinement discussions for iteration based agile teams. Teams can use this when they are new to the product, the product area or the problem domain. And then it says refinement meetings allow the product owner to present story ideas to the team for the team to learn about the potential challenges or problems in the stories. If the product owner is unsure of the dependencies, the product owner can request a team to spike the feature in order to understand the risks. Now, the unspoken truth about backlog refinement is that the product owner could invite people from the business to be part of those discussions, right? Right, in backlog refinement. But this says, we discuss requirements coming up in the next increment to gain valuable feedback. So who do you think the customer is? Who do you think is representing the customer? The product owner. The peel. Yeah, so would you say this is a stretch? Or would you say it's just calling the customer or looking at the product owner as the customer? Would you say it's a stretch? It's not a stretch. 
So there's absolutely nothing false. Does anyone want to uh, tell me what you think might be false here? Because you do know backlog refinement is for the next, it's really for the next go round. It's not for this go round. So we can establish that is true. And then as far as feedback from the customer, that's really just making you think, oh, there's no customer. Yeah, but the product owner could stand as the customer and the product owner could actually invite other people from the business. So this is not a far-fetched question. And as majority chose true, it is indeed true. So does anyone want to uh, come in on what, what might be false if you want to? If it makes sense, that's fine. We can move on. It makes sense. Yeah, Phil, um, just, because, just before you go ahead, I'd like to ask two questions. Um, if you can just explain again <clears throat> what they mean by spike the features and also uh, on the backlog refinement, I was um, doing uh, the assessment from uh, the cram.org and I got a question and he said the refinement is not time boxed. Like, Yes, yeah, so refinement is not even a formal event. So if you're looking in the context of Scrum, as presented by Ken Schreiber's company, Scrum.org, in or even Jeff Sutherland in the Scrum Guide, you don't find any time boxing for uh, backlog refinement. In fact, you don't even see it as a formal ceremony. It is expected to happen throughout organically. It doesn't have to be a hard and fast rule. However, in the Agile Practice Guide, we see a little bit different, but there's no Agilist professional who will tell you backlog refinement must be time boxed to this. No, because backlogs are different. That's one. Um, regarding the topic of spikes, the way PMI defines it, let's just take a look really quick. But spikes are just research or additional uh, mechanisms or enablement that you need to carry out. It could be prototypes, it could be research, it could be additional work that needs to be done before a story is actually carried out. So it's on page 154. And PMI say a short time interval within a project, usually of fixed length, during which a team conducts research or prototypes, an aspect of a solution to prove its viability. So before you actually carry out a story, you might need to do some research or prototyping, and then you can do it. Does that make sense? Cool. All right, let's move on. I think we've got about four more questions. So this is another one. You're leading a project to remodel an art museum. You are in the final stages of planning with the team and the customer. The customer has only been able to provide requirements at a high level as they feel they need to see some of the completed work before providing more details. You are worried about some of the more detailed requirements that may come on this project in order to embrace adaptability while simultaneously delivering value, what is the best thing you could do? Let's go ahead and launch the poll. Feel free to reread it. I'm gonna give you a minute, 15 seconds, a little bit long, this one. Good, that's a true or false poll. Thank you very much. Let's go ahead and get a regular poll. Let's relaunch. All right, there you go. Thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. Let's go ahead and end the poll. I appreciate you participating. So let's see which words are not agile or PMP minded. You know, a PMP minded view is you got to always think about the customer 
But at the same time, you also need to be adaptable and resilient. Let's read page 55. I'm going to read page 55 in the seventh. Now, don't freak out. Don't go get in the seventh. This is just for demonstrative purposes. I'm not saying go buy it. Build adaptability and resiliency into the organizations and project team's approaches to help the project accommodate change, recover from setbacks, and advance the work of the project. Adaptability is the ability to respond to changing conditions. Resiliency is the ability to absorb impacts and to recover quickly from a setback or failure. A focus on outcomes rather than outputs facilitates adaptability. And then it goes into most projects encounter challenges or obstacles at some stage. The combined attributes of adaptability and resiliency in the project team's approach to a project help the project accommodate impacts and thrive. If you turn the page over to 56, it has a number of ideas about how you can be resilient. Talks about short feedback loops, continuous improvement, uh, having a broad set of skills, T-shaped skills, uh, inspect, adapt, diverse project teams, open and transparent planning, which is the stage this question is in, planning. Did you catch that? Did you catch that this question actually said final planning? final planning. And then if you continue reading all the way through, you get an idea that you got to be intentional in how you become resilient and how you are adaptable. However, let's read. It says you're in the final stages of planning. Based on that statement, which kind of project do you think you're working on? Based on that one statement. You're in the final stages of planning. Traditional predictive. It's predictive. traditional. Exactly. It's traditional predictive. And you do know that if you're working on a traditional predictive type of project, as on page 14 of the Agile Practice Guide, in the Stacy Complexity Model, it shows you the simple zone. If you're working on the simple zone, what does it say? It says your requirements should be well-defined. Your technical uh methods should also be kind of clear, well-defined. So in this instance, if you're worried about detailed requirements coming out of the woodworks, it would only make sense to do something about it. So let's take a look at the words which are just outrightly not PMP. Force the customer. No. <laughs> no. no, you don't force the customer to do anything. This says to provide the detailed requirements to enable progress. That's not being PMP minded. That's not being a servant leader, no. So the word force, even if it said encourage, you would still be putting your customer in a box because these things are going to unfold, but forcing them is not really a good way of saying it. It's not an agile mindset. C, thank goodness no one chose C. We don't want to pad. We want to intentionally uh, assess uh, reserves. Uh, what are the two types of reserves? Who remembers? Contingency of management. Manage. Thank you. Mark is on it. He's on it. <laughs> thank you. Management reserves and contingency reserves. So we're going to cancel C. We, we don't pad. We do intentional reserve analysis. So we've got A and D. D, simply add the detailed requirements to the project as they become known. That would be pretty dangerous because if you're working on a project of this nature and you just keep adding stuff, not really good. There could be arguments. There could be misunderstandings. What PMI would want you to know is that there's absolutely nothing wrong in option A establishing a change control process. Because if you're working on predictive stuff, it is what you should do. And did you know that in the world of Scrum, a lot of people don't know, but there is hidden change control. A lot of people don't see it as that, but do you know that locking down the sprint plan once you are airborne, that is change control. You're not just gonna make a change 
midway in the sprint. That is all part of changing plans that are midway and putting controls in place to prevent that. Now, it's not to say that sprint plans couldn't change. A product owner could very well be persuaded to do it for one reason or another, but it's still a line of defense, some sort of, of control. So it wouldn't be D. The best option is A. All right. So well done. Uh, those of you who um, kind of analyzed it without going through all, all of my analyses, I hope you also gained something from my analysis of the question. Hey, Phil. That sounds like Taji. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I know that voice. <clears throat> How are I you doing? I it differently. Uh-huh. Go for it. Because in the beginning, as you said, it says you're in the final stages of planning. So it looks like you're in predictive, right? Mm -hmm. But then the second paragraph, it says you're worried about some more detailed requirement. It says in order to em embrace adaptability mm -hmm. while simultaneously de delivering value, that's all agile right there, right? Not necessarily. Adaptability, so delivering value. What is the best thing you should do? So to me, I was looking at it as more of, you know, agile where you could add requirements to the product backlog so the, and, you know, as the project becomes known, not the first part where it was started off as predictive. I was looking at it as maybe, you know, like that sandwich you talked about, predictive in the beginning and then, or not sandwich, where it was predictive in the beginning and then agile in the end. Mm -hmm. That's how I was looking at it, more of a hybrid approach. I get, I get your I point. D. I get your point. It's tricky. And then I was thinking if it's a predictive, you would always already have a change control process in place. Why Not do you need to establish a change? You're predictive. You already have that. But that is an assumption. But you're having a change it. control process when you're predictive, that's an integration. It's in perform integrated change control. So but why it, do it you didn't need say to establish a change control process. So I didn't say, what should you do next? It said, what is the best thing you could do? So even if you had done it before, well, that would have been the best thing you could do, which has been done. But it didn't say, what should you do next? And it didn't allude to having change control in place. So simply adding detailed requirements. And since it says project, it didn't say to the sprint or to the backlog, you got to just take it at face value, you see. So if, wherever you are, change control is not a bad thing. What PMI really wants you to pay attention to is the fact that you got to build in adaptability and resiliency, and you also have to have a game plan. Even if it was in the world of uh, predictive, you still would deliver value where possible. It's all about delivering value. That should be our mindset in general. And we should still embrace some sort of adaptability. Do you know that adaptability doesn't just have to be in a world of agile? Like you said, okay, it's a hybrid. Let's say it's a hybrid, but still there should be some sort of change control, you know? So that would be the best thing to do. That would be the best. Simply adding them, it's gonna eat you alive, you know? Especially even if it's a hybrid project. You get what I'm saying? So th this, yeah, kind of, this kind of forces you into final stages of planning. That means we're planning, then we're going to execute. So it's definitely not, not agile, totally. But nonetheless, it's a trickily worded question, and I, I give it to my question writer who, who wrote it. Not me. So, you know, it's not one of those failed questions. I decided that uh, I would give you a different dose of questions on this final run. Actually, this is a different question writer that wrote than the one who wrote all of the other 40-day questions, which you've been seeing over time. That's a different guy. <clears throat> Excuse me. This one is in the United States. The other, the other one is in, is in Asia. So you kind of get feel for different kinds of questions. All right. Here's another one. You just left your boss's office. He spoke with you about possibly leading a new project. He gave you a high level overview of the project and explained how the outcome of this project would have a major impact on your organization. He has asked you to write up a one pager on how best to deal with the change related to this project. What would you write about? 
give you some time and give you a poll. All right, well done. Let's go ahead and uh, end this one. Three, two, and one. All right, so very polarized. Well, let's read. You left your boss's office. He spoke with you about the, about possibly leading a new project. So this, this is not even a project, it's possible. He gave you a high level overview about the project. So you don't really have an in-depth view of it and explain how the outcome of this project would have a major impact on your organization. He has asked you to write up a one page on how best to deal with change related to the project. Think about that. Change, not change on the project, change related to this project. So you know there are different types of change. You have project change, you have organization change, and all sorts of other change. So I, I want to show you some definitions, some mindsets. It's in the immersion book, but let's see. Change management, also referred to as CM, is a collective term for how to prepare and support individuals, teams, and organizations in making organizational change. The most important or common change drivers are technology, process crises, consumer habit changes, and pressure from the business environment. Other drivers could include mergers and acquisitions and reorgs, also called organizational restructuring. Change management includes methods that enable the organization to redirect resources, budgets, processes and other modes of operation. Executives in our business world today are aware of the ever-changing business environment, the exponential growth, and global availability of information, the expanding global marketplace. All of these are triggers for change. Today's C-level executives should understand how important it is to have a clear strategy to guide their organizations in reaching their goals. Executive strategy requires successful delivery of project programs and portfolios that drive performance improvement. This is all from the immersion book, by the way. So with that in mind, my friends, this is talking more about an organizational change. Okay, so let me go back to the question. Okay, here we go. So how a risk mitigation plan could result in a change request is too lower level. This is a much higher level view. You see, this is really what you should be focusing on, uh, change related to the project, not change in the project. So how a risk mitigation plan could result in a change request is, is, is lower level. That's at the project level. The scope of the new project and how people should embrace it we're gonna leave that, we'll deal with that later. Project change control, again, this is too lower level. Higher level business, we're talking about change related to the project, not change on or within the project. So the importance of having a plan is not bad, but it's not at the right level. So you're faced with B and D. What is wrong with option B is it says how people should embrace it. So that kind of language is not giving people room to express themselves as far as not being on board with the change. And that's okay. 
So there's one more thing I want to show you as far as this change. You might want to look for the William Bridges transition model. I think I just talked about it. William Bridges transition model. This whole thing about the William Bridges transition model is on page 164. So let's read it. William Bridges transition model provides an understanding of what occurs to individuals psychologically when an organizational change takes place. This model differentiates between change and transition. And then it talks about the model identifying three stages, ending, losing, and letting go. That's one stage. And then it says, it is often associated with fear, anger, upset, uncertainty, denial, and resistance to change. So it's okay if people feel you know, adverse about the change. Then we have the neutral zone where people are now coming, almost coming to terms. It says productivity may drop as people learn new ways of doing work. And then we have the new beginning. Not everyone gets completely to the new beginning. Some people leave the firm and so on. But the scope of this new project and how people should embrace it is not in the spirit of understanding the William Bridges transition model uh, and not in not in the spirit of formulating the change. And, you know, it's getting people to discuss, not necessarily saying that they should embrace it. So that one is not a very good choice. The best one, which is at the right level, is the concept of change management, much higher level, and the concept of enablement. So this whole thing about change management and enablement, this is principle number 12 in the seventh edition, okay? Again, if you have the seventh edition, I am not telling you to go read the entire thing. That has never been my message. What I do want you to do is to at least know the principles. If 12 of them, I'm not saying you should cram them. Just read them and, and just have some familiarity. I think it would add value to your prep. I also ask that you go to YouTube and look for my video on all of the models, methods, and artifacts talked about in the seventh edition. I cover all of these in about one and a half hours. So you can definitely finish it in a couple of days. All right, but I just want you to be aware of such things. So let's read page 58, change. Prepare those impacted for the adoption and sustainment of new and different behaviors and processes required for the transition from the current state to the intended future state created by the project outcomes. It's actually not a bad one to uh, kind of be aware of. And um, that's why the answer is D. All right. Any questions about this? Any concerns? Does the explanation make sense? All right. We've got only one more question and you will be free. It's like going through immersion all over again. All right. Here's the final question. You're the project manager in a firm where resistance to change has been very high. Now you are leading a high profile project, which has been seen as a threat to many departments. As a project manager, what is one of the key things you can do to address this problem in your firm? Here we go. Let us relaunch. What do you think? All right, three, two, one. Okay, my friends, you are not fooled. Well done. Nobody's going for a reward system <laughs> to motivate, to bribe people. That's really what it's saying. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Bribery, that's what it boils down to. So uh, well done. The answer to this one is obviously C, communicate the vision one do it early. Okay. Well, you folks have done really well and it's been our longest day yet. Thank you so much for joining us today. Remember to go on down to praiseon.com and take a look at our offerings for PMP, CAPM, Microsoft Project, and other trainings. We've got trainings on scaling, training on agile, JIRA, risk management, and you can get the immersion books as well. Don't forget, subscribe to the PMP exam radio show. Just click on that link 
and it'll take you to where you can listen to the PMP exam radio show on any of the platforms. Thank you very much and all the best as you continue this journey with us.